offer as part of our hearing today. If you'd like to submit materials, please send them to the email address that has been previously distributed to your offices, and we will circulate the materials to members and staff as quickly as possible. I would also ask all members to please mute your microphones when you're not speaking. This will help prevent feedback and other technical issues. You may unmute yourself anytime you seek recognition. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. I wanted, however, the very first sound to be in this hearing, gunfire. Even before we offered instructions, directions, email, gunfire. And the reason is because imagine the whole litany of gunfire in America through weapons of war. There was no notice. There was no information given. There were no signals. There were no instructions about emails or anything else that might have saved our children. It was gunfire. So today the subcommittee turns once again to the subject of gun violence, examining this ongoing crisis by focusing on one of the most terrible tragedies in our nation's history. The murder of 21 people, 19 of them children, on May 24, 2022, at the hands of an 18-year-old armed with an AR-15 style rifle at Robb Elementary School in Evaldi, Texas. That school still stands. In September, Representative Julian Castro and I held a hearing in Uvalde where they listened to parents of victims, citizens, and Anafal Reyes, a teacher in room 111. Mr. Reyes told us that he did not realize what was happening until he saw the bullets breaking sheetrock off the walls. He saw the shoot, shooter's shadow and the sparks coming from the gun as he fired into his classroom, hitting him and then his students. No notice, gunfire. As Mr. Reyes lay on the floor for some 77 minutes, the shooter sat at his desk and taunted him. He poured water on him. He smeared Mr. Reyes own blood onto his face, then shot him in the back to make sure he was dead. Fortunately, Mr. Reyes survived. We got a call when he got the call that morning. Julio Cazares rushed to the school, a parent. While he and other parents begged officers to rush in, he could hear shots being fired inside. As officers began to bring children out of windows, Julio hoped to see his daughter Jacqueline emerge from one of those windows. Sadly, he did not see her. Instead, he later saw his daughter pulled out of an ambulance at the hospital. We now know of the cascade of failures that led to the tragedy at Robb Elementary School. An investigation by a special Texas House investigative committee found that systemic failures and egregiously poor decision-making contributed to the loss of life. Gunfire makes no appointment. Gunfire by an automatic weapon, a weapon of war, never stops. Despite the eventual presence of 376 law enforcement officers, not one of them confronted or engaged the shooter after a group of first officers on the scene tried to approach rooms 111 and 1112 were met with gunfire, gunfire from an AR-15 style rifle. Without an assault weapons ban, more people will die. And if we're not going to ban them, then law enforcement must be trained to confront these weapons of war. Yes, we must train law enforcement like warriors in a battle on the combat field. Gunfire from an AR-15 style rifle turned those armed officers on their heels and left them paralyzed in the hallway for well over an hour. Uvalde Sheriff Ruben Nelasco led a litany of chaos, confusion, and inaction that day. His failures coupled with the presence of an assault rifle left every little hope left very little hope for the children in rooms 111 and 112. Although the officers had information that a child was on the phone with 9-11, surrounded by dead bodies, Sheriff Nalesco led officers away from the immediate threat instead of ordering them to storm the room and try to save the children. That day, law enforcement's failures of implementation, planning, tra training, and duty delayed paramedics' ability to reach those who might be saved. We saw the video of parents trying to climb 
through windows or trying to break through doors. Let me be very clear. This is not a comment on the millions of law enforcement officers who today and days have gone by stand ready to serve, who have broken into places to save people, stop burglary, stop murder, save children, dumped into water, and risked their lives. Don't dare suggest that is the comment today. Don't dare. But what we are saying is that we have to be honest and that babies have died and parents are mourning. And the federal government has to be the final and ultimate word of responding to the sacrifice of those babies and the parents who mourn. We know for certain that Eva Morales, a teacher in room 112, died in an ambulance and three young students died in local hospitals, including Jacqueline, who died at 1.17 p.m. from gunshot wounds to the chest. We will hear today from Faith Mata, a young woman whose 10-year-old sister, Tess, was murdered that day. Ms. Mata will tell us about the hours she spent waiting, hoping to hear that her sister was among the survivors, only to have officers ask her for her DNA sample in order to identify her sister's body. Law enforcement failed the Mata family and every other family represented at Robb Elementary School that day, including the siblings of Uzziah Garcia, who are so afraid to go to school that they get sick to their stomachs. The victims of the horror, and these are babies, 10-year-olds, that took place in Uvalde were also failed by this country's gun laws. While some states restrict the purchase of long guns, including assault weapons, until the age of 21, Texas and federal law allow those guns to be purchased at age 18. The Uvalde shooter asked multiple people to purchase guns for him before he turned 18, but fortunately, they refused. As soon as he was old enough to legally buy the guns for himself, again, 18, not 21, he purchased two AR-15 style rifles. In less than a week, he amassed more than 2,000 rounds of ammunition, with the bulk of it being delivered to his doorstep. It is important to note that the shooter had already purchased 60 30-round magazines, a holographic sight, a snap on trigger system in February before his 18th February birthday. In some states, the shooter's behavior might have allowed someone to raise a red flag and alert authorities that he might be a danger to others and prevent him from obtaining a firearm, but Texas has no such law. These must be federal laws. Again, a red flag law would have stopped the shooter from obtaining these deadly weapons and saved so many precious lives. And they shouldn't be able to opt in. It should be the federal law. As a country, we banned the sale of assault weapons for 10 years, but when the ban expired, we saw a tripling of number of active shooter incidents, a tripling in the average number of people murdered in active shooter incidents, and the mass shootings, the school shootings, the grocery store shootings have continued unabated. Yesterday, we observed the 10th anniversary of the massacre at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut. Nothing has been done. On that horrific day, 20 first graders as young as six years old and six teachers were lost to gunfire. Like Uvalde, the Sandy Hook shooting was perpetrated by a young man only 20 years old armed with an AR-style, 15-style assault weapon who had killed his mother before going to the school. Today, in memory of that tragedy, we'll also hear from Nicole Melchiona, a survivor of that massacre. She remembers all too well what it was like as a seven-year-old child to hide in a classroom, trembling in fear, thinking that she would never see her family again as the crack of gunfire echoed the halls of her school. Nicole still bears the scars of her trauma, yet she will come today and bravely tell her story in the hopes uh, that we will take action so that no child will ever endure that again. Democrats in Congress have spent more than two decades trying to do something, anything, to stop the violence and end the bloodshed. We hope the Republicans will join us, but they oppose us at every turn. During this Congress alone, Democrats have put forward numerous policy proposals to prevent losses of life like those in Uvalde, Buffalo, Sandy Hook, Tree of Life, El Paso, Las Vegas, and the Pulse nightclub, among others. Through this committee, we have supported raising the age of firearms, extreme risk protection orders, or red flag laws, or renewed assault weapons ban, restrictions on large capacity magazines. I introduced a simple bill honoring Kimberly Vaughn uh, Firearm Safety Storage Act. She died at Santa Fe, 14 years old, which would have encouraged the proper storage of firearms and ammunition. Democrats also put forth numerous bills to invest in the fund, uh, in fund law enforcement, including bills that would provide better training and targeted resources coordinate the creation of an active shooter alert, and ensure better communication and trust between our law enforcement and the communities they serve. Led by our chairman, Chairman Nadler, we've worked every single day. But bill after bill, policy after policy, our friends, Republican colleagues, oppose our efforts to keep our communities safer. They've repeatedly opposed legislation that could prevent violence, and they've opposed investments in effective law enforcement. 
And while rejecting and distorting our common sense proposals, Republicans have offered no credible policy solutions of their own. We hope today, as the meeting says, that we can develop a bipartisan approach. As a result uh, of these lax gun laws and underinvestments in law enforcement have led to higher rates in red states, have had spillover effects across the country as guns flow into our communities without restraint. In June, after Uvalde, we were able to enact the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. While the act took a step forward on gun violence prevention, we, we have so much more to do. Without further action, our communities will continue to suffer losses of life, like those in Uvalde, which affect our mental health, our sense of safety and security, and our trust in law enforcement. Just this morning on the news, I heard a citizen in Washington say, as much as they try to work, he's just sick and tired of gun violence. That is why our hearing today is so important. We should all be sick and tired of gun violence and violence by weapons of war. I look forward to hearing from each of our distinguished guests who will speak directly to the issues of gun violence that threaten our nation's safety. I thank our survival witnesses for their bravery and willingness to share their stories. Without objection, I submit into the record the following documents. Texas House of Representatives Investigative Committee on the Robb Elementary School Shooting Interim Report, the Advanced Law Enforcement Rapid Response Training Alert Center's Robb Elementary School Attack Response Assessment and Recommendations. I now recognize the distinguished gentleman from Arizona, the ranking member Biggs, for his opening statements. Mr. Biggs, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate this, uh, you holding this hearing today and appreciate you uh, recognizing me for a few minutes to, to provide an opening statement. We'll never forget the, uh, the, uh, the horror of Uvalde and those who were victimized will also remain in our hearts and our minds. Um, and as the chair has said, it, there was a cavalcade of failures on that day. There are many reasons that evil persists and that evil lacks. We, I welcome our two of our witnesses, our two witnesses today. We have Dr. John Lott Jr., who's an economist, world-recognized expert on guns and crime. He served as the Senior Advisor for Research and Statistics in the Office of Justice Programs and in the Office of Legal Policy in the U.S. Department of Justice, and has held research or te teaching positions at various academic institutions, including the University of Chicago, Yale, at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, Stanford, UCLA, and Rice. And he was the Chief Economist at the U.S. Sentencing Commission during 1988 to 89. He holds a PhD in economics from UCLA. Nobel laureate Milton Freeman noted John Lott has few equals as a perceptive and analyst of controversial public policy issues. He's a prolific author uh, for both academic and popular publications and has published over 100 articles in peer-reviewed academic journals and written 10 books, including More Guns, Less Crime. His most recent books are, are Dumbing Down the Courts and How Politics Keep the Smartest, How Politics Keep the Smartest Judge, Judges Off the Bench. He's been one of the most productive and cited economists in the world. From 69 to 2000, he ranked 26 worldwide in terms of quality adjusted total academic journal output and fourth in terms of total research output. Among economics, business, and law professors, his research is currently the 14th most downloaded in the world. I also welcome the Honorable Jack Brewer to uh, be with us today. He is from Fort Worth, Texas, grew up in Grapevine, went on to uh, a successful athletic career, both in, in track and field and in professional football. But beyond that, though, Mr. Brewer is, um, is a humanitarian. He's an ordained evangel evangelist who's dedicated his life to initiatives aligning with biblical commandments to serve the fatherless, the poor, the widows, and the captives. That's what his focus is. He will be talking today about the, the need for families if we're going to stop violence of all kinds, in particular gun violence. To date, his foundation has delivered over $70 million in medical aid, supports over 55 orphan care centers, and helped deliver sports equipment to over 1 million underserved children, and helps bring medical care to over 20,000 women and children around the world. I'm delighted to welcome our two witnesses here today. One other thing that our distinguished chair a woman said today is we have to be honest. But despite of the title of the hearing today, there hasn't been an honest engagement in search for bipartisan solutions to gun violence, mostly because 
there's only one solution for my friends across the aisle. That is to emasculate the Second Amendment and remove guns from, from legal, lawful, and uh, law-abiding citizens. For proof, just look at the bills they've either introduced or brought through the committee in the 117th Congress. For example, they have pushed legislation to infringe upon the rights of law-abiding Americans, such as federally mandating background checks on all firearm transfers, red flag laws, banning certain semi-automatic firearms, extending background check waiting periods, establishing new federal databases, and establishing a national firearm registry. Those proposals, gun, gun law experts have explained will do nothing to end gun violence or in the criminal use of firearms. <clears throat> they did this while demonstrating a complete lack of respect for and understanding of the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding Americans. Don't take my word for it. Let their own words speak for themselves. President Biden stated, quote, a nine millimeter bullet blows the lung out of the body. So the idea of these high caliber weapons is of, there's simply no rational basis for it in terms of self-protection, hunting. I mean, I just, and remember, the Constitution, the Second Amendment was never absolute. Law enforcement, military, and ballistic experts agree that that claim, those claims, are pure nonsense. When talking about the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding Americans, one of the representatives on this committee stated, quote, spare me the bull about constitutional rights, close quote. And that same representative also questioned whether or not someone with a semi-automatic rifle has ever been stopped by a law-abiding American with a firearm. Specifically stated, I don't think there's a single, and I'm quoting here, I don't think there's a single incident, and maybe there's one, but I've not found one of an assailant using an assault weapon that was stopped by a person with a gun. Literally a month before he made that claim, a woman stopped what law enforcement indicate was likely to be a mass casualty event in West Virginia when she shot a man carrying an AR-15 type rifle with her handgun. There's one example. An example from November 24th, 2022, was that when a 23-year-old woman in a suburb of Chicago uh, licensed to have a carry, carry conceal permit, stot, shot a man trying to break into her car early in the morning. Just last week, a 56-year-old Chicago man being robbed by four suspects on, the, on Chicago on the west side turned the tables and shot three of the robbers, wounding two of them and saving his own life. Democrats aren't interested in searching for the causes of these horrific and tragic acts of violence, which is, as I said, the persistence of evil in the world. And how do we curb that? They're only interested in trampling on the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding Americans. And today we're examining the tragedy in Uvalde. The murderer there was estranged from his father and engaged in numerous heated conflicts and arguments with his mother, who um, was not was having trouble raising her son. I bring up the shooter only because in Uv the shooter in Uvalde is not unique in having a difficult and troubled home life. Dr. Peter Langman, an expert on the psychology of school shooters and other perpetrators of mass violence, examined 56 school shooters and found that, quote, 82% of the sample either grew up in dysfunctional families or without their parents together for at least a significant part of their lives, close quote. Research from Dr. Brad Wilcox, a professor of sociology at the University of Virginia and senior fellow at the Institute for Family Studies, finds that males growing up in single mother homes are nearly twice as likely to end up delinquent compared to males who enjoy good relationships with their fathers. This is not to denigrate single mother homes, having my own mother grow up in such a home. It is only to talk about the difficulties and the exacerbation of, of raising a family that goes hand in hand with these difficult situations. How long can we continue to ignore these findings if we're really gonna search for bipartisan solutions to put a stop to these tragic, tragic events? My colleagues across the aisle would like to ignore the connection between adolescent males growing up without their fathers and these violent events, and yet study Studies indicate very clearly there is a significant correlation and probably a causative effect. In fact, during a hearing this Congress in a plea for new gun control laws, our own chairman stated, quote, a recent study in the American Journal of Medicine found that compared to 29 other high-income countries, the gun-related murder rate in the United States is 25 times higher, even when you adjust for population differences, 
Americans are disproportionately killed by gun violence. One of the critical differences, of course, is that other countries have stronger gun safety laws, close quote. The fact is that those, this country has numerous gun laws and penalties already in place for those who violate those laws, for those who sell guns, those who distribute guns, those who traffic in guns, and, and those who use guns uh, illegally for violent purposes. And what the chairman failed to acknowledge is the fact that nearly a quarter of children in the United States live with only one parent. That is also more than any other country on the planet and has a direct correlation to all the violence in our society, including gun violence. It is now time for us to proceed with this hearing. I'm looking forward to the compelling testimony of all those who are, who are here today, but it's also something, if you're, going to, uh, if you're going to look at this testimony, it's important to look at root causes for this violence and not focus solely on taking away Second Amendment constitutionally protected rights. With that, Madam Chair, I'll yield back. Thank you, Chairwoman Jackson Lee, for convening this hearing. And I thank the witnesses for being here to inform this committee about how the tragedy in Uvalde can help us continue to develop effective solutions for combating gun violence. For decades now, America has faced an increasing crisis of gun violence, from the mass shootings that have become a routine part of American life <coughs> to smaller incidents of community violence, to shootings within our homes and our places of worship. Gun violence has permeated every aspect of our society. And while every incident of gun violence deserves recognition and remembrance, it is the mass murder of children in the schools that we trust to keep them safe that strikes the deepest chord. Yesterday marked the 10-year anniversary of the massacre at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut, the deadliest grade school shooting in our nation's history, a history that is littered with far too many school shootings. We'll never forget the 20 children, young children, only six and seven years old, and six adults who lost their lives to a 20-year-old young man armed with a semi-automatic assault weapon rifle, a weapon of war. And we will not forget the national outcry for change, for meaningful gun legislation that would prevent similar incidents in the future. But for nearly a decade, those cries went unheeded, as Republicans in Congress stymied any attempt at reforming our gun laws. So month after month, year after year, the shootings have continued. San Bernardino, Orlando, Las Vegas, Parkland, Pittsburgh, Thousand Oaks, El Paso, Boulder, and still Congress did nothing. But this past year we reached a turning point when in the span of 10 days, 31 people were killed, were murdered in mass shootings in Buffalo and of course in Uvalde. The massacre of 19 school children and two adults at Robb Elementary School was a tragedy so horrific that it is difficult to comprehend. From the lax gun laws that allowed the 18-year-old shooter to stockpile military-style weapons and ammunition just days before the shooting, to law enforcement's unfathomable failure to respond quickly and to take all possible actions to save the lives of children, the Uvalde shooting encapsulates so much of what characterizes America's crisis of gun violence. And it is through the lens of the tragedy in Uvalde that we can, we must look for solutions. This committee did just that the week after our earlier hearing, moving the Protecting Our Kids Act, which passed the House on June 8th of this year, with the vast majority of Republicans voting no. The act combined, contained several critical measures to prevent gun violence, including raising the age for buying semi-automatic rifles like those used in Sandy Hook, Buffalo, and Uvalde, establishing new federal offenses for straw purchases of large capacity magazines, safe storage requirements, and statutory bans on bump stocks and ghost guns. Because of continued Republican opposition, the act did not have sufficient support to pass the Senate, despite the cries from the families in Uvalde and throughout the nation. But just a few weeks later, Democrats and Republicans in the House and the Senate finally were able to come together to pass the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. Though it was not nearly as expansive as our House champion bill, 
and nonetheless proud of what we were able to achieve with the Bipartisan Safety Com Safer Communities Act. The first meaningful gun legislation in decades, the act requires enhanced background checks for firearms purchasers under the age of 21. It creates new federal straw purchasing and trafficking offenses, and it provides critical funding for violence intervention initiatives, children and family mental health services and school programs, including safety programs. It is a critical first step, but it is only a first step. Experience has shown us that there is still so much more to be done. This committee has tried, but most Republicans have opposed every type of gun legislation we have advanced. Extreme risk protection orders, banning assault weapons, and raising the age to purchase semi-automatic firearms. Each of these measures could have prevented the tragedy in Uvalde and, and so many others. It is no surprise then that in the few months since Uvalde, we have continued to see more mass shootings. From the July 4th shooting in Highland Park, Illinois, to the Walmart shooting in Chesapeake, Virginia, to the recent massacre at Club Q in Colorado Springs, we have learned that even when police act as swiftly as possible, and even when heroic citizens risk their own lives to stop the bloodshed, there is no act of heroism that can stop an AR-15 assault-style weapon from killing dozens of people within minutes. As we have said time and again, as the evidence has shown, this is a uniquely American problem and it demands a solution from us, the representatives of Americans have chosen to pass laws to protect them while safeguarding their constitutional rights. As Mr. Biggs quoted me as saying, Americans are 25 times as likely to die from gun violence as citizens in other countries. And no one can slander the American people by saying that we are 25 times as mentally ill. We are focusing today on the tragedy in Uvalde because it highlights so many of the issues that we must address in order to stop the bloodshed. The extraordinary harm caused by assault-style weapons and ammunition, the likely effects of gun safety legislation such as extreme risk protection orders, active shooter alert systems, and raising the age of purchasing semi-automatic weapons, best practices and policies for law enforcement agencies who respond to active shooter situations, how to best protect our youngest and most vulnerable Americans in their schools, and how violence intervention strategies can work with traditional responses to reduce gun violence. I look forward to hearing our witnesses' testimony about these and other issues related to our crisis of gun violence. I thank the witnesses for coming today, and again, I express my gratitude to Chairwoman Sha Sheila Jackson Lee, who has fought so passionately for gun safety legislation for convening this hearing. I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman for his testimony or his statement, um, and I now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Uh, thank recognize you, Madam Chair. for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I would just want to thank all our witnesses for being here today, but in particular, Mr. Lott, who is an expert on firearms and firearm laws, and Mr. Brewer for his, uh, his work in supporting the institution of the family. You know, um, the first institution the good Lord put together wasn't the church, it wasn't the state, it was moms and dads and kids. And the strength of that institution ultimately, I think, determines the strength of our culture, our society, and our great country. So we appreciate uh, all our witnesses, but in particular, the, the two Republican witnesses. And with that, I would yield back and look forward to the testimony. It is now my pleasure uh, with a sense of sadness to introduce uh, today's witnesses. First, Face Mata is the big sister of Tess Mata, one of the 21 lives lost at Robb Elementary School in May of this year. She's joined by her parents, Jerry, an aviation mechanic, and Veronica, a kindergarten teacher. I'd like for them to stand with their baby Tess. Faith is a senior at Texas State University, where she is pursuing a degree in psychology. Thank you, family. Dr. Ray Guerrero is a board-certified pediatric specialist who was born and raised in Uvalde and attended Robb Elementary School. He treated several of the victims on that day, that terrible day, 
Dr. Errol is their doctor. He is the children's doctor. And he saw these children over and over again. Dr. Guerrero has over 16 years of experience in medicine, including serving as chairman of pediatrics at Valverde Regional Medical Center, assistant professor of pediatrics at Baylor College of Medicine, and serving as the medical director and CEO of Encina Pediatrics and Primary Care. He didn't sleep for days as he was working with families. Can you imagine his pain? Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Faith, for being here. The Honorable Roland Gar uh, Gutierrez, who has served in uh, the Texas State Senate representing District 19, he previously served as a member of the Texas House of Representatives from 2008 to 2021. He is a representative of the people. And I met him for the first time going to Uvalde, as the first member, as we worshiped in church that Sunday after the massacre. He never stopped. He never stopped comforting those parents. He gave up his life, daily activities to just be there and fight for them. Senator Gutierrez has a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from the University of Texas at San Antonio, Juris Doctorate from St. Mary's University of Law, and we thank you for being here. Jack Brewer, who has a Master's in Education as CEO and Portfolio Manager of the Brewer Group Incorporated, Founder and Executive Director of the Jack Brewer Foundation, Chair of the American, America First Policy Institute Center for Opportunity Now. He is an ordained minister and a professor at the Fordham uh, Gabelli School of Business, where he is the program director for the Athletes and Artists Executive MBA program. Mr. Brewer is also a former NFL safety, who was appointed to the U.S. Commission for the Social Status of Black Men and Boys under the previous administration. Welcome. Jack Locke, Jr., PhD, is an economist and commentator who focuses on guns and crime. During the previous administration, he served as a senior advisor for research and statistics in the Office of Justice Programs and in the Office of Legal Policy in the United States Department of Justice. Dr. Lott has held research and teaching positions at various academic institutions, including the University of Chicago, Yale University, the Wharton School of, Uni of uh, the University of Pennsylvania, Stanford University, UCLA, and Rice University, and he was the chief economist at the United States Sentencing Commission from 1988 to 1989. He holds a PhD in economics from UCLA. Welcome. Nicole Melchiano. Did I get that? Melchiano? She's got a thumbs up. Was, second, was in the second grade at Sandy Hook Elementary School when a gunman entered the school and killed 26 people on December 14th, 2012. Yesterday was the 10 year commemoration and recognition of that day. In 2018, she participated in the March for Our Lives. She began to mature a student-led demonstration called calling for an action to end gun violence. In 2020, she joined the Junior Newtown Action Alliance, became its legislative coordinator. Last year, Nicole is just a senior at Newtown High School at this time. Welcome. Chief Anthony D. Halt is Associate Vice President and Chief of Police at Wayne State University during a career spanning more than 40 years. Chief Halt rose through the ranks and held multiple positions within the University Police Department. He is the past president of the Metro Detroit chapter of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives and currently serves as Special Advisor to the National President of Noble and is a member of the Noble Executive Board. Welcome. T. Christian Heine is Vice President of Policy at Brady. He began advocating for stronger gun laws after a man with a history of violence shot his parents on Memorial Day in 2005. His father survived multiple gunshots, but sadly, his mother was killed. In the wake of this tragedy, Mr. Heine and his father started a chapter of the Brady Campaign to prevent gun violence in Ventura County, California, and helped to pass several local ordinances. Since that time, Mr. Heine has successfully developed, lobbied, and helped implement a variety of local, state, and federal policies. Thank you for your work on the Emily Vaughn Storage Act and other legislation. Before joining Brady, he served as the legislative director at the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence. 
as I begin to welcome you, all of you as distinguished witnesses, and thank you for your participation, I will start by reassuring the nation that you are under oath and telling the truth to your best of your capacity. I ask you to stand and raise your right hand at this time. As you raise your right hand, I will administer the oath. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, so help you God. Let the record show the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Please note that your written statement will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, I ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes to help you stay within that time frame. Uh, there is a timing light on the screen. While the light switches from green to yellow, you have one minute to conclude your testimony. When the light turns red, it signals that your five minutes have expired. And before I recognize uh, Faith Amada for five minutes, allow me to acknowledge a friend and colleague who joined me on the first and I believe only field hearing from the federal government in Uvalde and that is uh, Congressman Castro of San Antonio is here with us today. I thank him for his presence uh, here today. Uh, it is uh, important for the family to know uh, that the federal government from different committees is concerned about you. And so I ask uh, Ms. Mata uh, to begin her testimony. You're recognized now for five minutes. Good morning. First and foremost, I would like to thank Chairman Jackson Lee Ranking Member Biggs, and other members for allowing me the opportunity to speak and share my story. My name is Faith Mata. I am a 21-year-old coming up on my last semester of college preparing for my future, a new future without my little sister, Tess, and a future of having to navigate this new life without her. I was an only child for quite some time. It was just myself and my parents, Veronica and Jerry. Being alone was hard and a lesson of being independent. When I reached 10, my parents had a conversation to let me know they would not be having any, any more children. It would just be me. I remember crying and begging for them to please bring me a sibling. I didn't want to grow up alone. Not even three months later, my mom got a call letting her know she was pregnant. And I now was going to be a big sister. I can still recall the days going with my mom to her appointments, seeing the sonograms, and soon finding out Tess was a girl all up until the day she was born, February 6, 2012. Bringing Tess into our life was a blessing in disguise. My sister brightened our darkest days. Tess was the outspoken, courageous, daring, determined, and nurturing person in our family. Our family was whole at this point. We would have family night every Sunday where my dad would put on movies or suggest we play some board games. Tess convinced my parents to bring our mattresses into our living room and we would all sleep in the same room. Those days were the best, no matter how annoying it was sleeping next to her. It was an unsaid tradition of taking countless road trips every summer to a new destination we had never been before and spending time just as a family. We were so happy. My family was perfect in my eyes. Then came time for me to move two and a half hours away from home to begin my college career. It was hard being away from home and not being able to see my sister grow day by day. Every time I came to visit, Tess was getting bigger and smarter before my very eyes. It is a beautiful thing to see as an older sibling, but being the older sibling, it is my duty and obligation to be her role model and the person whom Tess admired. She was my purpose and strength to be the best I could be. It was always bittersweet having her run out of our house to come and greet me with hugs and smiles and it hurt seeing her cry and beg me to stay just a little longer when I had to leave back home. Even though I was away at college, our bond was strong and it was so precious to me and her. We, walk, we talked numerous times of her attending my soon-to-be alma mater and how she, will, how she would live with me while she went to school. We were planning our futures to make sure we would always be together. May 24th, 2022. 
I was getting ready for work around noon when my cousin had alerted me to call my mom. My mom said, it's okay. The officer said it was a barricaded subject. I proceed to call my dad. He's standing in front of Rob Elementary and tells me, there are so many people here. It looks like a war zone. Fast forward about an hour, news goes around. A teacher has been shot along with eight students. My heart sinks, but still not knowing who the teacher is or the kids. My thoughts were, it's not my sister. It can't be. This would never happen to us. Then full panic kicks in. My mom calls to tell me, they're moving kids to the Civic Center. No luck finding Tess. Dots start connecting. The teacher was in fact my sister's, and many of the kids that were considered missing at the time were all in the same two classes, room 111 and 112. My roommate drove me back to Uvalde, where along the way I was calling hospitals in San Antonio, Texas, looking for my sister. After two hours of driving, I was at the Civic Center with my parents, where we waited in a room with other family members. We waited about eight and a half hours until we found out my sister was among the 21 that were deceased. The days following the death of my sister, I took on the responsibilities and tasks that my parents could not bear to do. My parents should not have to plan their own child's funeral. So I felt the need to step in when they needed me the most. Our life has changed forever. It has darkened because our light has left. The child and the little human who once made this family whole is no longer with us. Tess will never get to experience the life we had prayed she would live. She will never graduate high school, never fall in love herself, never be present at my wedding. And we will never know how scared she was in her last moments in that classroom. All we have left is the questions which was once filled with her laughter and the stillness that only Tess could help us move out of. Today I am here sharing my story, but we are not tired, but are we not tired of hearing the stories of victims? Of hearing them from victims' families? Are we not tired of hearing yet another tragedy because of gun violence? When is enough enough? I truly hope that this never happens to any other family in the days, months, or years to come. This debatable topic on assault rifles should not be brought up again because someone else's child or sibling was murdered. It's just an excuse at this point. You may never understand what my family is going through, and I'm not asking you to. But today, you can make a change to help families never have to feel what my family feels, the families of Uvalde feel, and the many others of the mass shootings. Thank you. We now recognize Dr. Guerrero. You're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I'm grateful for the chance to testify before this committee and share my perspective on gun safety in America. As a rifle owning son of a rancher, as a pediatric doctor, and as a member of a broken community traumatized by the loss of 19 children and two teachers in May, I believe my experiences reflect the deep complexities of the gun control issue, and my feelings no doubt echo those of many in our country. But today I want to share a few things that I know for certain, because I am a doctor, and when it comes to solving problems, we doctors prefer to stick to the facts and the science rather than get caught up in the emotion no matter how hard that is. When you choose a career in medicine, you're signing up to make people better and save lives. Healing is always the ultimate goal. And we use a number of strategies to do that depending on the challenge. In the modern developed world, we have a plethora of incredible machines, tools, equipment, regimens, and, machi and machines that test, diagnose, administer, and sustain to cure. You've all no doubt crossed paths with at least one of these. Maybe it was a Doppler, an MRI machine, or a course of anti-COVID drugs. For my patients, I'm always looking for the most effective remedy or tool that I can find to relieve their pain, to stem the bleeding, or to kill the pathogen. So I understand the power of an effective tool. The AR-15 is a very effective tool. It was designed to deliver quick and heavy fire in combat. It was made to be light and easy to use. And it's as exacting in its application on the battlefield 
as radiation in a patient with cancer. So let me ask you this. How comfortable would you be if every day during homeroom, your kids and grandchildren were being administered radiation therapy for two hours? Never mind the books with suggested material in the library. I'm talking about highly radioactive particles flooding into the beautiful, healthy bodies of your precious children on a daily basis. Why not? We have all the potential to develop cancer. To, we all have the potential to develop cancer. Maybe it could be preventative. If this sounds like a ridiculous or terrifying prospect, you're right. Because cancer radiation doesn't belong in the bodies of healthy children. Just like AR-15s or any semi-automatic weapon that holds high-capacity magazines don't belong in the hands of everyday civilians, especially when they're not old, even old enough to buy a pack of beer. They are not appropriate for self-defense in the home, in the school, or in the supermarket. They are and always have been designed as military-grade killing machines. We've made significant process on sensible gun legislation. Most Americans agree that we need background checks, age limits, and safe storage rules. But one of the arguments I hear on repeat from the chorus of objections to the ban of assault weapons is that the problem isn't the guns, it's the people who pull the trigger. This is a meritless argument. How does an anti-Mexican extremist walk into Walmart and kill 23 people in minutes without a semi-automatic rifle? How does an anti-LGBTQ radical slaughter 49 club goers without his Sig Sauer MCX? The children in the classrooms of Sandy Hook Elementary, Marjorie Stone Douglas, and Robb Elementary School never stood a chance against the speed and the power of the weapons they faced. And let me tell you, these kids, they weren't helpless victims before that day. They were spunky, intelligent, street smart kids. I know this because some of them were my patients. Tess Mata, who you just heard about, I knew since she was a newborn. Amory Garza was two months old. Amory was trying to save her friends when the 18-year-old burst into her classroom wielding the AR-15 he bought the day after his birthday. She was calling 911 when she was shot to death. She knew what to do. She was brave. She was a fighter. But against a weapon like that, she had no chance. No chance to run, to hide, or to, or to shout for help. The following is audio that I was given by a parent of kids from across the room where the kids were murdered. These children survived. But this is a shrill screaming of kids trying to get out while their classmates are being murdered. Amory's call never connected. When you see pictures of Amory and her friends on the news, you should know they didn't get buried looking sweet and happy like their photos. Some were missing limbs, some had holes in their tiny chests. You might mistakenly imagine a funeral where a child lies peacefully in a colorful coffin, but make no mistake, there's no peace in the death of a child by a weapon of war. Guns are now the leading cause of death among children. Yes, it's not the flu or drowning or even car accidents, because we dealt with that with seat belts and car seat regulations. AR-type weapons and bump stocks play a devastating role in this tragic statistic. And here we are, still squabbling about who gets to keep what. Last time I told you I was, I was, I was here, I told you it was one of the reasons I wanted to work with young patients was because of how flexible and open their minds are about treatment and learning from their experiences. But of course, they're not always enthusiastic at the outset. As a pediatrician, I had to learn a few strategies for dealing with children who didn't want to follow doctor's orders. I had to convince them to trust me when they're too scared to get a shot or get their blood drawn. So you know I've got all kinds of tricks up my sleeve. More screen time, Disney pencils, stickers. I might be the only doctor who doesn't give out lollipops though. As I sit here today, 10 years after Sandy Hook and six months after the massacre in my own town of Uvalde, I'm asked what we can do about finding solutions to gun control. I find myself thinking about those pencils and stickers because the naysayers and obstructionists in this debate about assault weapons, the people who don't want to give up their toys, they look like adults, but they sound a hell of a lot like children to me. As I said, I'm a gun owner. I believe in the Second Amendment, but I'm also a doctor, and I deal with facts over emotion. So yes, I love an effective tool. But when, it comes to a, when a body comes into the hospital riddled with bullets, there's no tool that's going to help. And I'm left to wonder, what is going to take to take these guns out of the equation? What is going to stop this? You've seen all the evidence you could possibly see that they inflict needless death and destruction. So what's it going to take to change your minds? Children require lollipops for convincing. As their protectors, 
We just need to look at the horrific trage tragedies that repeat in our country time and time again. No convincing required. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. Thank the doctor for his testimony. Thank you. Senator Gutierrez, you're now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Jackson Lee and members of the committee for this time. Ranking Member Biggs, I see her coming back in. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. May 24th was the worst law enforcement response to one of the worst school shootings in our nation's history. As policymakers, you and I have to grapple with how much loss of life is acceptable in relation to someone's freedom to obtain and carry a weapon that can inflict so much damage. I have to believe that we as lawmakers can solve this problem because the alternative is just too evil to contemplate. This shooter waited until his 18th birthday to secure an AR-15 from the local gun shop. He was followed the next day by buying hundreds of rounds of ammunition at the same gun shop. And on the third day, he followed by picking up his internet-bought Daniel's Defense AR-15 at the same gun shop. Nobody asked questions. Nobody called the sheriff. Nobody cared. On the 24th, he began his shooting spree. By shooting and wounding his grandmother, he proceeded to the school and killed 19 children and two teachers. Let me be clear. Police waited outside for 77 minutes while children lay dying, wounded, waiting for help that would not come. They were injured, huddled on the classroom floor. Children called the police as the gunman taunted them to see if they were dead or alive. Brave little girls called 911 while law enforcement waited outside just a few feet away. Not one law enforcement official took control inside or outside of that building. It is worth noting that this community asked the sitting governor of Texas directly and through the Department of Public Safety for money to fix the radio system years prior to, mass, to, prior to this massacre. And it's the same radio system that the director of the Department of Public Safety acknowledged in a hearing in the Texas Senate needed replacing. Local law enforcement at any level, not city, not county, police, they never, ever took command and control. The state police never took command and control either. Even though they had 91 of their Operation Lone Star troops on the ground, including Texas Rangers, who stood around and talked to their supervisors over the phone. Supervisors who did nothing, ordered no action. Law enforcement agents said over and over, DPS is coming. In turn, DPS waited on federal agents to breach the door to the classroom and try to end the suffering of the bleeding children. Without direction, law enforcement seemingly waited on each other to do nothing. 77 minutes later, a federal BORTEC team, exasperated by inaction, used a key to gain entry into the classroom to kill the gunman. One minute prior to the breach, DPS Captain Joel Betancourt issued a first radio order to the team that is about to breach, asking them to stand by. How much longer he wanted these kids to wait remains a mystery. At the end, kids were piled together in two heaps in two classrooms. The teacher lay shielding several children as best she could. She and the children were all dead. Children and bodies were dragged out into a hallway where again officers jammed the hallway seemingly watching the few that were actually trying to administer aid to the remaining children that made it out alive. The child was dragged out of the hallway. Her face was gone. Always in classrooms had blood like no horror movie you've ever seen. Off camera, you could hear grown men throwing up from the side of the horror or perhaps the failure that they had caused. Thirteen injured children survived. Three others and one teacher were taken out alive but died on their way to the hospital and they bled out in that golden hour. As troopers tended to their injuries, a brave little red-headed girl, Chloe Torres, said to one trooper, I called the police 
Did you get my calls? Was it you I was talking to? She said to the female trooper. She cried and she asked for her friend, the same friend, E. Marie Garza, who had covered her body, who had shielded her, Chloe's body, the friend who had saved her life. She cried. She's gone, isn't she? I know she's gone. Chloe was on a bus because they couldn't get ambulances into the school, so they took four kids on a bus, and she was riddled and covered in, in blood. In the aftermath, police pointed fingers at, at different agencies. We were led to believe that this was one incompetent school cop, then led to believe it was an incompetent Uvalde police cop, then led to believe that it was a few officers from DPS and their incompetence. There is no transparency and no accountability to date. My question to the leaders of this country is how many children have to be murdered before they are willing to ban the chosen weapon of these school shooters? How many people have to be killed before we take reasonable steps to end murder? Thank you, Madam Chair. I thank the gentleman for his testimony. I now want to recognize Mr. Brewer. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, Ranking Member Biggs, distinguished members. Oh, I'm sorry. Madam Chair, Jackson Lee, Ranking Member Biggs, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to appear before you today. I'm a resident of Parkland, Florida, and I understand the impact of these tragedies on our communities. I'm a father of four. Unfortunately, I've experienced gun violence firsthand. At 14 years old, my friend shot a skinhead in the neck in self-defense after a group tried to break into his house. I will never forget the trauma I felt from having to serve as a witness in that case. Trauma and fear hardened me. After I was threatened and bullied and harassed by skinheads, I started to carry an illegal pistol at 15 years old, or 22 long to be exact. I even took it to school after the skinheads threatened me. I didn't know it then, but I know it now. I was traumatized. I'll never forget being shot at and seeing a stray pellet skin my cousin's arm. I was a young kid with all the world in front of me. I was a straight A student, a great multi-sport athlete, and even the director of my church choir. If I was caught with that gun in my pocket, I would not be testifying before you today. If I had shot and killed a skinhead or a bully back then, I may still be in prison serving a life sentence today. The difference between me and the hundreds of young black boys who are shooting at each other every week in communities across America comes down to one word, father. The reason I thought twice about ever using that illegal gun I carried in my pocket is because I had a hard-handed daddy at home that would whoop my butt. I had a fasting and praying mom at home that taught me the fear of my father which art in heaven, and I had a father in the flesh and a father in the spirit. Proverbs 13 and 24 says, he that spareth the rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chastiseth him betimes, and betimes means before the usual or expected time, early. The very school shootings that have brought so much darkness to our nation's history are exacerbated by fatherlessness. A 2016 study found that out of a sample of 56 shooters, only 18% grew up in a stable household with both biological parents. And we know this Uvalde shooter did not have a man a man of God in his life. When I saw that this was a bipartisan hearing to find solutions to gun violence, I prayed that the men and women of God in this room would finally be bold enough to focus on the root cause. Talking points may win elections, but addressing the root cause is the only way to solve a crisis. Research has indicated as many as 85% of shooters in communities were previously arrested and most of them arrested for violent crimes. My foundation has worked on addressing the root cause of these issues in some of the most impoverished black communities on the planet. 
Recently, a neighbor uh, of mine was shot in the face, and the two young gunmen ran past the kids at my youth center. As you can imagine, they are traumatized, fearful, and hardened. The same feelings and emotions that I had at their age, carrying guns and always looking over my shoulder. The difference is, is 80% of my kids at my youth center are fatherless. Gun laws are the least of their worries. If they cuss a teacher out, refuse to do their work, or beat up someone, they have little or no consequences in the public school system today. Parents have little or no responsibility for the actions of their children. If we are serious about addressing gun violence, then we need to first get serious about bringing the paddle and prayer back to our public schools. Proverbs 22 and 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will never depart from it. In today's America, we have 18.6 million fatherless kids, more than any nation on earth. And we all know that kids are 20 times more likely to have a run-in with law enforcement if they're fatherless. We do not even teach the Ten Commandments in our public schools anymore, much less hold our children accountable to them. As Mr. Nadler mentioned earlier, this is an American problem. If we leave the Capitol today and decide to ban all guns, have we really done anything to address the root cause of gun violence? Walk into any prison in America and you will see a facility full of men who are locked up for crimes related to illegal guns. Charges ranging from murder and robbery and trafficking, carjacking, possession, distribution, to name a few. I run programs for thousands of men in the prison many of whom committed gruesome gun-related crimes. The majority of these men share one common thing. They are all fatherless. Many of my students in my prison transition out and remain in our second chance programs. Several even work for my organization. One of the most violent men that I've ever met in prison is currently my roommate. He found full salvation through his father in heaven and he was able to meet his biological father for the first time at 50 years old after com completing 22 years in prison for violent crimes. Yes, he shot a man. He happened to be sent to a prison with real Christian-based rehabilitation programs. Unfortunately, despite the chatter about criminal justice reform in our public prison system in jails across America, we're warehousing men and women and we're not rehabilitating them. The solutions I speak do not come from me, as I have never committed gun violence. I've only had to deal with the results and the victims as a minister and as a father. I assume not many of you in this chamber have ever pulled the trigger on an illegal gun. If we really want to solve these issues, Mr. Brewer, can you don't you think that up? we consider proven solutions? Can you come to a conclusion? Thank you. As a proud American, I'm a, dedicated, I'm a dedicated servant to my community. I pray that we can humble ourselves and stop being conformed to the misguided politics of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds, that we may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. Thank you for having me, Ms. Chairwoman. Thank you very much. Um, Madam Chair, I have a question, a point of uh, parliamentary inquiry. What is the gentleman's inquiry? Every single one of the first three witnesses, which are the Democratic witnesses, went over on their time. When we got to the first Republican witness, you chided him down. So I would ask if you're going to have discernment and openness and allow each of these witnesses to talk and give their statement, then to allow that across the board for all of the witnesses. In the name of Jesus. Thank you. Well, for the record, let the gentleman uh, reflect uh, that Mr. Brewer went over and I tapped by two minutes and I tapped for him to come to a conclusion. Um, and I think Mr. Brewer was able to complete his statement. Fairness is a golden rule of which I abide by as a chair. Dr. Lott, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, Chairwoman Jackson Lee, Ranking Member Briggs, and other distinguished members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to speak to you all. I desperately want to do something to stop the horrific violence that Representative Lee and the other witnesses have so movingly described this morning. But I want to do something that actually matters. Unfortunately, many of the proposals won't help or will actually make matters worse. 
take background checks on the private transfers of guns, known as universal background checks. There isn't one mass public shooting this century that would have been stopped if such a law had been in effect and had been perfectly enforced. Worse, no one is talking about the massive errors in the background check system and how it overwhelmingly discriminates against black and Hispanic males being able to go and defend themselves and their families. We hear calls for bans of so-called assault weapons, but the vast majority of firearms in the United States, including these assault weapons, are semi-automatic guns that function, are functionally identical. Even the influential Associated Press style book acknowledged earlier this year that terms such as assault weapon and weapons of war convey, quote, little meaning, and quote, are highly politicized, end quote. The AP makes it clear that these firearms are not used by any militaries around the world. Despite the references a couple times, they are not automatic weapons. President Biden has frequently said you only need an AR-15 to hunt deer if the deer have Kevlar vests. But an AR-15 functions exactly the same as any small caliber hunting rifle, firing the same bullets with the same rapidity and doing the exact same damage. Banning guns based on them looking like military weapons, you know, the key phrase is often military style, makes no sense. Of course, banning all semi-automatic guns, as President Biden has repeatedly called for over the years, would mainly affect law-abiding citizens, while I guess at least is logically uh, more consistent than banning military-style weapons, it would make it much more difficult for Americans to use guns defensively. If you want to ban all semi-automatic rifles, what's the alternative? A manually loaded gun, where you have to physically put another round in the chamber after you fire each shot? If you, fire, if you face multiple attackers, or you fire and miss, or you fire and wound but don't incapacitate the attacker, someone may not have the luxury of time of manually reloading the gun to be able to go and protect themselves. Claims about these laws having overwhelming support are based on surveys that s simplify and mischaracterize what these laws do. Surveys show that when Americans are accurately, accurately informed about what these laws do, change there, with, with strong support changes to strong opposition. There's four facts I'd like to try to get across. One, over 92% of violent crime in America has nothing to do with firearms. That percent has remained fairly constant for the last couple decades. The vast majority of violent crime has nothing to do with, with firearms. The second point is while the US media doesn't give much attention, if any, to coverage of mass public shootings in other countries. Mass public shootings per capita are relatively low in the United States compared to a number of countries in Europe as well as the rest of the world. Over the 20 years from 1998 to 2017, the United States had 1.1% of the world's share of mass public shooters and 1.8% of the mass public shooting murders. Both are significantly less than the US's 4.6% share of the world population. People don't take into account that the United States has over 330 million people. You can't compare it to a country with 5 million or even Germany with 80 million without adjusting for the sh different sizes in population. Many of these countries with much higher uh, mass public shooting rates and deaths have very strict gun control laws. The third fact is 94% of the mass public shootings occur in places where civilians are banned from having firearms. We've heard many times today about the Buffalo mass murder earlier this year. If you read his manifesto, he spends a great deal of time, like many of these killers do, explaining why he picked the target that he did. I'll read it to you. His manifesto says, Quote, attacking in a weapon-restricted area may decrease the chance of civilian back backlash. Schools, courts, or other areas where concealed carry are outlawed or prohibited may be good areas of attack. Areas with strict gun control laws are also great places for attack. I can give you quotes from one manifesto after another, from one diary after another, and they're on our website at crimeresearch.org, where these killers, time after time, tell you, but the media ignores the fact, never reports, 
this part of what's in their manifestos. <clears throat> the fourth fact I'd like to get across is the most vulnerable people in our society benefit the most from owning guns. If my research convinces me of anything, there are two groups of people who benefit the most from being able to go and protect themselves. One are the people who are most likely victims of violent crime. That's overwhelmingly poor blacks who live in high crime urban areas. Police, anybody who's read my academic research knows that I think police are extremely important. But police understand themselves that they virtually always arrive on the crime scene after the crimes occurred. And that raises the question of how people should act when they're having to confront a criminal by themselves. And the research shows overwhelmingly that by far the safest course of action for people to take is to have a gun. And that's particularly true for people who are relatively weaker physically, women and the elderly. You're almost always talking about a male criminal doing the attack. And when a man is attacking a woman, there's a much larger, larger strength difference that exists there than when a man's attacking another man. We've heard a lot about different attacks that occurred this year. Dr. Locke, are you, can, can you finish? Will you be yes. finishing soon? Okay. Thank you. Sorry. But if you go through the list, the Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas was a gun-free zone. The Tulsa, Oklahoma a hospital shooting was a gun-free zone. The Walmart mass murder in Virginia was a gun-free zone. I could go through others. But our research shows that overwhelmingly, when you see these attacks, they occur in schools where teachers and staff are not allowed to carry. It's not by accident. Thank you very much. Witness time has expired. And now pleased to recognize Nicole Melicciono uh, for five minutes. Welcome, dear. Thank you so very much. My name is and on December 14th, 2012, I was a second grader at Sandy Hook Elementary School. I was sitting on the carpet with my classmates waiting for my teacher to give us directions for the day as we heard what sounded like large metal pans being smashed together come from the hallway. My teacher quickly ran to the door to see if anyone was in the hall and pulled two students into our classroom to join us in lockdown. She then shut the door and turned off all the lights. As the gunshots continued to ring through the hallways, we huddled by our cubbies and my teacher pulled over a desk and grabbed a book to try and read to us so we could calm down. As she was reading, she began to heavily shake and I knew we were in danger at this point. I felt a strong sense of nausea come over me as I thought I would be the first to die if the gunmen got into our classroom because I was close to the door. We then heard a knock and shake on the door handle, which was terrifying because we didn't know who it was. But after deciding to open the door, we were evacuated out of the school by the police and taken to the firehouse nearby to reunite with our families. The firehouse was chaotic and everyone was running around, yelling, looking for their children as everything was still so unclear. I then went home that day and my town endured the most horrific aftermath after finding out 26 beautiful, innocent souls were taken from us that day. In less than five minutes, an AR-15 fired 154 bullets, killing 26 people. How do we continue to allow this? I have grown up in a world where the unimaginable happens over and over again, uncovering trauma over and over again. I am not I am here not only because of the trauma I have endured in the past, but also because I am terrified of it happening again in the future. We live in the constant aftermath of an action from our lawmakers that we voted into office to do everything in their power to protect us. I have met amazing people in this fight, both survivors and victims of gun violence, which is a community that has grown far too big. We have been pushing for an assault weapons ban, which is a crucial step to decreasing these mass shootings with, an un with unacceptable death tolls. We also need red flag laws implemented in all 50 states, as well as a federal safe storage law for all gun owners and universal background checks. That is just the beginning of the work that needs to be done. We see time and time again that these shootings are pure acts of hate. Buffalo, Uvalde, Pittsburgh, Parkland, whether, it has, whether it's racial inequity, anti-Semitism, soci socioeconomic backgrounds, high schools, grocery stores, the cold grip of gun violence has touched far too many and has no boundaries. 
America is alone in this battle to live freely for a reason. Our lawmakers have not taken bold, life-saving, crucial action to protect what the majority of Americans believe in, which is common sense gun safety measures. I am here today to beg you to please do everything in your power to enact measures that prevent every, everything you care about being lost within seconds, because with no action, it is not a matter of if, it is a matter of who is next and we ran out of time over a decade ago. We need to, we need to act now. Thank you. I thank you very much for your testimony, Nicole. Chief Holt, you're recognized now for five minutes. First, I'd like to thank the committee for the time for allowing me to test testify this morning to support matter. <clears throat> I first want to bring you greetings on behalf of our, our national president, Brenda Goss Andrews, uh, she could not be present today due to a previous commitment. Uh, the executive board, member, and constituents of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, <coughs> Noble. Uh, I, I serve as a special assistant to Brenda Goss Andrew, and I'm the current chief of police at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. I have served over 40 years in law enforcement profession, and I have an experience responded to more than my share of violent gun victims, including the loss of life of one of my officers who was fatally shot in the head. And like everyone here, parents are not supposed to bury their kids. Uh, yesterday marked the 10th anniversary of the Sandy Hooks Elementary School shooting that occurred in Newtown, Connecticut, with 20-year-old Adam Lonson shot and killed 26 people. The vast majority of the victims were children, ranging in age of six to seven years old. In total, 20 of the 26 victims were children. The Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting is the deadliest mass shooting in an elementary school in U.S. history, and the fourth deadliest mass shooting overall. We at Noble released a statement acknowledging the 10th year anniversary and once again express our heartfelt prayers and condolences to the affected families and communities. Unfortunately, our nation again experienced a mass shooting at Robb Elementary School in Uvat, Texas, resulting in the deaths of 19 students and two teachers in an elementary school not unlike Sandy Hook Elementary School. Again, we want to express our heartfelt prayers and condolences to the effective families and communities. Of course, there is a difference in time, place, location, victims, and the circumstances leading up to the violent act of shooters at both mass shootings. However, there are certain undeniable elements within our nation that exist during both the Sandy Hook shooting and the Robb Elementary School shooting. The main one is being the lack of an assault weapon ban. Noble is very concerned about the level of gun violence in the United States, and specifically the correlation between violence and proliferation of assault weapons and high-capacity ammunition magazines. It is our organization opinions that violence, particularly gun violence, is a public health issue. As with all public health issues, It demands a comprehensive, non-judgmental, pragmatic, evidence-based approach to saving lives and reducing injuries. Noble, along with the organizations such as the National Gun Enforcement Partnership to Prevent Gun Violence, is committed to addressing the pervasive nature of gun violence and the horrific impacts on communities across America. Specifically, firearms-related injuries at death to include homicides, suicides, accidental shooting is unacceptable and demands immediate attention. The aim of this program is to reduce injuries at death due to improper gun storage, especially as it relates to the safety of young children. This is a program that a national president of Nova launched entitled It Starts at Home. Additionally, Noble advocates for limiting high-capacity ammunition magazines to 10 rounds, 
and the regulation of new semi-automatic assault weapons. In 2016, in 2016, assault weapons accounted for one in four police officers killed in the line of duty through gun violence. Noble supported the bunks, the Public Safety Recreational Farms Use Protection Act, or Federal Assault Weapons Ban of 1994. A positive step towards addressing the level of gun violence in our nation was taken with the passage of the Bipartisan Safer Community Act. Noble supported this legislation. The bill combines gun safety legislation with mental health and school security resources. The bipartisan gun deal increased funding and improves mental health, school safety, crisis intervention, and anti-violence program. Among other things, it requires tougher background checks for younger gun by violence buyers, those who are deemed at risk in certain cases, and closes the so-called boyfriend loophole. This bears intimate partners who have been convicted of domestic violence, crime against their significant others for having a gun even if they don't live together. Lastly, law enforcement plays a critical and crucial role in preventing gun violence and solving crime. Effective strategy for, a strict, for strict enforcement laws concerning illegal possession, trafficking, and criminal use of firearms are vital and need to be supported by data, research, technology, training, and best practice. Because the public health and safety depends on the efforts of law enforcement agencies. We must have the resources sufficient to prioritize the protection of officers and communities against illegal guns and firearms violence. The crisis of gun violence in our country necessitates a sustained, coordinated, and collaborative efforts involving citizens, elected officials, and the entire criminal justice system. Our members stand ready to meet the needs of our community and nation. Thank you again for this opportunity to provide testimony. Thank you. Now recognize um, the gentleman, Mr. Heine, for five minutes. Thank you. Chairwoman Jackson Lee, Ranking Member Biggs, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Christian Heine, and I'm the Vice President of Policy and Programs at Brady, one of the nation's oldest gun violence prevention organizations. Brady works across courts, communities, and Congress to end America's gun violence epidemic. Our organization carries the name of Jim Brady, who was shot and severely injured in the assassination attempt on President Reagan's life. Jim and his wife, Sarah, led the fight to pass the landmark Brady Bill nearly 30 years ago. And I have been a part of this movement for almost two decades. Uh, and much like Jim and Sarah Brady, I come to this work unwillingly. Memorial Day weekend, 2005, my parents, Tim and Jan Heine, were returning a boat they borrowed from my dad's best friend, Steve Mazin, after a vacation spent in Big Bear, California. What they didn't know is as they began unhitching the boat in the driveway, a gunman with a long history of violence and a backpack filled with firearms was parked across the street. Steve was chatting with my mom when the gunman emerged from his vehicle, walked up the driveway, and shot Steve in the stomach. He immediately turned the gun on my father, shooting him multiple times. Rather than running away, my mom had stayed with Steve. She was trying to desperately keep him alive. And the gunman walked back, stood over her, and in the last words she would ever speak, she begged and pleaded for him to stop. When it was clear that he wouldn't, she got up, ran a few steps before he shot her. On May 30th, 2005, my mom, Jan Heine, was killed with a single bullet to the spine. Over the next day, this gunman terrorized our community, hospitalizing two children, killing their mother, and shooting and wounding a sheriff's deputy. Thanks to the incredible work from neighbors, first responders, trauma surgeons, my father, he survived, and we'll forever consider ourselves very deeply lucky for that. Despite the efforts of many, including my mother, Steve unfortunately also died from his wounds. Now, after years of working in the gun violence prevention movement, I have realized that the only truly remarkable part of my story is how unremarkable it actually is. Our lives were forever altered, but we had simply joined an ever-growing club of people, devastated by an epidemic of gun violence that continues to rage on with a regularity that no other industrialized country allows. 
I have also learned that so much of this pain and anguish is inextricably tied to failures of policy. Today we are discussing the bipartisan solutions to gun violence within the context of a horrific mass murder that took place in Uvalde, Texas. The lives of 19 children and two educators were ended with an assault weapon and yet another devastating attack on a school. We also hold this conversation 10 years and one day after the heinous shooting at Sandy Hook. We look at these shootings and we ask, how is it possible that something like this can happen? And in the past 10 years, we've asked this question again and again and again. The answer, however, is simple. No community is truly safe from gun violence when our leaders have done so very little to prevent it. So, 10 years and more than a million gun deaths and injuries later, we're still here. In spite of the fact that a vast majority of gun owners, non-gun owners, Democrats, Republicans, and independents overwhelmingly support policies that can prevent it. By expanding and strengthening the Brady background check system, by preventing guns from being trafficked into communities and investing in those communities to break generational cycles of violence, by reducing rates of suicide, domestic violence, and unintentional shootings, by incentivizing and requiring the safe storage of firearms, and yes, by mitigating mass shootings by reinstating the ban on assault weapons and large capacity magazines. And let's be clear, more guns are not a solution. That is a myth perpetuated by an industry that wants to sell more guns. If more guns made us safer, we would already be the safest country on the planet. American gun violence is a multifaceted issue that will persist unless our elected leaders enact targeted solutions. And if not, we will, back, we will be back here again 10 years from now asking the same question yet again. I leave this committee with one final reminder that your decisions here have tangible impacts in all of our lives. Think of the 350,000 people killed by guns since the Sandy Hook shooting, a grimly disproportionate number of whom were black men and victims of suicide. Think of the jarring fact that the leading cause of death in America right now for the first time in our history is firearms. What I will think about is my wedding day when the most significant day of my life, there was an empty chair that my mom should have been in. <clears throat> I'll think about all the times I wanted to pick up the phone, tell her a story, or hear her laugh. I'll think about how she's never held her grandchildren. And I'll think about all the families this year that will have to live through Christmas without their child, and the inevitability of those who will join our club unless representatives here take the requisite action to prevent it. I sincerely thank the committee for this opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. not present the, very, the first two weeks. So I kind of took charge and was having to talk to family, friends, having to talk to news media, and having to ask for our own privacy. Um, you never think that 
you have to actually ask for your own privacy when you lose a loved one. But during a time like this, we did, and it was having to, we were basically having to navigate our own grief that was a public issue. How deep was the pain? How deep was the pain? It hurts. I lost my other half. I lost my person. My parents lost their youngest kid. I mean, how do you not look at us or the other families of mass shootings and not feel for us? Do you think it was a kid that didn't behave that killed your sister or was it an assault weapon that killed your sister? I believe mental health played an issue, right? But when we make it accessible for people with mental health problems to get these weapons, we're failing America and you failed my sister. Thank you, Dr. Guerrero. Pediatrician has a happy job <clears throat> with happy faces from birth as you watch them grow up. I'm just gonna have to ask you, you have clinical experience. How bad were the wounds? I need you to describe how bad were the wounds that you saw. I want everybody to see how many times this scene was repeated in Uvalde. How many times it occurred at Sandy Hook children, and then we can go across the line from Pulse to El Paso, but in this instance is caskets of children. Could you explain that wound, please, from this type weapon? Right. So I think it's important for everyone to realize that um, there was two wounds that I saw, because there was only two kids that I saw at, at that point in time that made it to the hospital. Everyone else was dead in the classrooms. Um, but the wounds I did see, as we saw from my previous testimony, um, a child that I wouldn't have recognized unless I saw pictures from before from the award ceremony because um, this child was headless, um, ripped apart. Uh, the other child had a chest wound so large you could probably put your hand through it. So it's very hard for me to understand when people try to say that uh, these type of weapons cause the same kind of injury as a pistol or any other smaller caliber weapon does. Because I think we know that, or at least I know, that's possibly not even true. Um, again, I've never seen a kid shot before, but these were uh, devastating injuries that uh, no one could have survived. Would you say the bodies were mutilated? Yes. Or would you say that if someone had a pistol that that would have equaled what this weapon did to these bodies? No. Did you, rush in, did you rush in as a first responder really to try and save lives? No, I was called in just to kind of help in the aftermath uh, because like I said, there was no one being brought to the hospital that was, that was savable whenever I got there and I just happened to see these kids in the back that were, that were already deceased. And the kids that survived, survived, you know, shrapnel injuries, injuries that were tolerable that they could get past, but the, the kids that were directly shot were, were dead. Nicole, what are the fears, Ms. Melchiano, that you have even today? You're a high school senior, is that not correct? What are the fears you have today? What do you live with? Um, when I was younger, I dealt with bad anxiety. I wasn't really able to sleep very well for many years um, leading up to almost middle school. I think to this day, the parallels between Sandy Hook and Uvalde just is a, a big eye-opener to America that we really haven't done anything. And a lot of gun violence in our country is due to systemic racism. It's due to poverty. It's due to homelessness. We know a lot of that is very underrepresented in the media. and. The fact that gun violence is the leading cause of death for children is unacceptable and um, leads everyone, the next generation, afraid to grow up in this country, to raise a family in this country. Myself, my friends still deal with the trauma from that day and we're all fighting. Newtown is still fighting 10 years later for change. It's sad that it's been 10 years and I have to sit here in front of you. and. Turning that trauma into, into action is not something that is easy to do, but we feel that it's necessary to get anywhere. Thank you, Nicole. 
As I finish very quickly, Senator Gutierrez, you have reviewed the reports, watching body cam footage, speaking to the family members when it comes to training our law enforcement officers to respond to mass shootings. I just want to get past and get to the heart of it. What the heck happened there, if you could, please? Uh, Chairwoman, it was uh, system failure, it was communication failure, it was cowardice, it was uh, you name it, any number of things that happened on that day. As I've said before many times, this was the worst response to a mass shooting in our nation's history. What should the federal government do? Um, one of the things that pervaded uh, Congresswoman was a federal agent went up to a DPS trooper, nobody was in charge, nobody took charge. And one of the federal agents said, I'm, I'm waiting on my BORTAC team to get here. Um, when they arrive, you know, and he said, I, I'm, I'm glad to help whatever you need. And then all of a sudden that became, we're waiting on BORTAC. Prior to that, it was, we're waiting on DPS. Prior to that, it was the sheriff. The sheriff says, I wasn't in charge. DPS was in charge. D DPS was in charge. DPS says the sheriff was in charge. It all started with the story that this was all, the guy that was supposed to be in charge was the, the school cop. No one took charge. And the sad part about these types of events is they don't happen in a vacuum. Had this young man not had access to this type of weapon, all of those failures wouldn't have made a difference, but he did. And he waited until his 18th birthday to get him because he had tried and failed prior to that. Unfortunately, in Texas, you can get this type of weapon at the age of 18. Let me thank you for your testimony. Um, and as I yield to... That is from a child in the room. Ms. Biggs, you're now recognized. And Mr. Mr. Owens and is our first. Okay. Now recognized. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Chair. Uh, I also want to thank the, the witness here today. The violence and sinless, senseless uh, murders that occurred in Uvalde, Texas were horrific. As a father of six and a grandfather of 16, my heart will always be heavy for those who lost children that day. Following the Uvalde tragedy, my hope was that Congress would examine both the root causes of this violence and ways we can strengthen our communities to make our schools physically safe. Unfortunately, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle put forth a hasty, partisan, and overreaching package of gun control bills that they developed without any Republican input. Today's hearing seems to be more of the same for the Democrats, beating a drum of restricting constitutional rights of law-abiding citizens while ignoring other contributing factors leading to the increase of violence and ignoring common sense solutions that should be part bipartisan. For example, in June, I introduced a Secure Your Students Act, Secure Our Students Act. This bill would have redirected billions of dollars of unused and already allocated funds from the American Rescue Plan to each district throughout our country. It would have provided safety based on their customized needs, whether it be hard infrastructure, innovative software, or security personnel. If brought to the floor and passed, it would have guaranteed that the conversation we're having today would never happen again. I was disappointed, but not surprised, that the Securing Our Students Act wasn't even considered by my Democratic colleagues. The safety of our children should be, as adults and parents, our number one priority. In this case, the Democratic majority purposely ignored the solution, keeping our children today at risk, all to their re religious zeal and priorities for gun control. Another bill that should have been had bipartisan support was the, Al the Luke and Alex School Safety Act, introduced by Representative uh, Mario uh, diaz Ballard in February of last year. This bill would have established a clearinghouse, a national database of school safety best practices which would have been available to schools, law enforcement agencies, institutions of higher learning, and to the public. Again, the Democrats declined to, to, de declined to bring this bill to the floor for discussion or vote. There are root causes that my colleagues on the other side refuse to address, possibly because of the decades of anti-family anti policies that have gotten us here. I'm grateful to my friend Jack Bauer for joining us today and having the courage to tackle this topic. 
Jack and I have a lot in common, both proud conservative black men, both former NFL players, and more, most importantly, both passionate about shining a light on the plague that has infected our country of sorry, self-centered, and cowardly men who with no shame abandon their children and families. I'm proud to work with Mr. Burrow on HR 1180, a fatherhood initiative that simply states fatherhood is essential to the development of all children and that the increased involvement of fathers in the home will lead to economic prosperity, educational excellence, and improved social mobility for children across all racial and ethnic groups. With the remainder of my time, I'd like to give Mr. Burrow the opportunity to respond to the following questions. How does the absence of fathers in the home contribute to the violent behavior in adolescent males? And what are some of the other contributing factors? Thank you, Congressman Owens. Um, I serve a number of fatherless kids every day, uh, particularly in the state of Florida, uh, and I also serve in prisons across the country. Uh, and so looking in the eye of men who have actually pulled the trigger, firing illegal guns, shooting at each other, killing people, and asking them, not asking myself what I feel and what policies and what changes can be made, but actually asking them why and how. How can we actually solve these issues versus being partisan? Fatherhood is essential. We see it. If we don't do something about this epidemic, if this was anything else, we would have already addressed it as Americans. When you look across and see 18.6 million fatherless kids in our nation, it should make our stomachs hurt. And the fact that every time we look up and see someone do a mass shooting, they never have a strong-handed daddy in their life. At what point are we going to be brave enough to address those root causes? I go to prisons every week. I'll be in another one next week. And so I'm crying out for those guys in the prisons. Because at the end of the day, they're growing up in poverty. They're growing up without parents. These, these kids are hurting. These are Americans. And so if we continue to put billions of dollars into our criminal justice system without putting any money into rehabilitation programs, without putting many, any money into programs that are going to make sure that our fatherless population have strong men who can mentor them, who can help them academically in school, who can run sports programs, we have a nation in crisis. We're confusing our kids with all of these policies that are anti-family and anti-God. And so, Mr. Owens, um, I'll yield back, but I, I just want to thank you for your bravery. And there's a lot of young boys that look up to the Super Bowl champion that sits in these halls of Congress. And you continue to fight for the real solutions. They're not popular. Trust me, I get bashed. I'll get bashed today for just being here. But I'm okay with that because the God I serve is much bigger. Congressman Owens, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barrow, for your leadership, your vision, and for being a uh, voice in the wilderness. Thank you, my friend. I yield back. Thank you both very much. And as I yield to the chairman of the full committee, we have just uh, passed a one-stop shop that deals with a lot of those issues. Thank you. I yield to the chairman of the full committee, uh, the distinguished gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Chief Holt, we've just heard testimony from uh, Mr. Brewer that the causes of our gun violence problem are lack of fathers, and from uh, Professor uh, Lott that uh, there's no effective difference between a, uh, an AR-15 and a single shot uh, a gun. Could you comment on this testimony, please? In my experience in law enforcement, I think it's a huge difference between the AR-15 assault weapon and a 9mm or 38 revolver. Uh, I think the key is my officer was killed with an assault weapon. Uh, recently, as two months ago, I responded to a Detroit police assist where a high-powered pistol with an extended magazine I uh, shot an officer and killed him from the back of the apartment building. He was lured into this trap. Uh, I, I think it's something to be said for a strong family background. But I don't think that is the solution to what we're facing right now with gun violence in the United States, and particularly in my city. Thank you very much. Uh, in other words, this testimony is, 
with respect to the pre prevention of gun violence, idiotic, and I agree with you on that. Uh, Mr. Hain, this year we were able to make some progress on gun violence with the passage of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, yet there's still much more to be done to prevent gun violence. As this legislation gets implemented, how will it make our community safer, and what will happen if we don't take additional actions to build on the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, such as the legislation that uh, passed in this House but not in the Senate? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Chairman Adler, for the question. Um, and the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act is a really important step. I, I would say um, a number of policies uh, and a package that undoubtedly is going to save lives, uh, but it's not going to solve gun violence overnight. Uh, I would actually you know, mention the fact that the, bi that the universal background check, something that 90% of Americans support, what would serve as a foundation for all gun laws to function, was off the table during that negotiation. So uh, while we were incredibly excited about things like addressing the dating partner loophole, the historic funding for extreme risk law implementation, uh, funding for community violence intervention programs, which addresses a lot of the root causes that we're talking about, community investments in order to address the cycles of gun violence, all of that stuff is gonna have tangible impacts in communities but we do have a lot more to do to address gun violence in all of its forms, and, and this committee has done an incredible job of putting some of those solutions forward. Uh, thank you. Chief Holt, uh, un unarmed bystanders uh, disarmed the shooter at Club Q in Colorado Springs, and law enforcement was on the scene within minutes, yet five lives are still lost. What does this say about the limitations of law enforcement when we allow assault weapons in our communities? I think the issue to respond to that question, and I'm going to respond to it as how we train and how we respond to something like that. Uh, proper training, preparation, resources usually prevent these sort of incidents or allow you to respond to these sorts of incidents. The incident that happened in Uvalde has been discussed, examined, dissected, and results given. I think what we do, when you have an active shooter like that with an assault weapon, we don't stand by. Well, we go in with our training and with the proper resources to neutralize that threat and prevent any more collateral injuries as such that took place there. Uh, thank you. Um, Ms. Melchiono, when you went through this experience, you were seven years old. As you've grown older, there have been other sh school shootings, Parkland, Santa Fe, Oxford High School, Uvalde. Each of these was a mass shooting in a school campus, two of them with assault rifles and high fatalities, just as you experienced. What was it like to hear about these events? It was definitely re-traumatizing. The parallels between Uvalde really uncovered a lot of trauma that I had experienced in the past. Um, growing older with these memories that I experienced on December 14th, 2012. Um, they're always in my mind, and as I grow older, processing it over and over again is hard because you think of it in different ways and you understand it in different ways, and it makes you question why we keep allowing this in our country and we, we don't take any action. And Parkland, I think, was one of the first times when I really questioned why we choose to live like this in our country. We know that a lot of these shooters are obtaining these AR-15s and their guns legally, and we need to implement change to make it harder. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. As I yield to Mr. Stuvey for his time, I want to thank all the members that have come to this hearing uh, and recognize the gravity, uh, the gravity of this issue. Thank you. Mr. Stuby, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chief Holt, isn't it true that the functionality of a semi-automatic handgun is exactly identical to the functionality of a semi-automatic rifle? It, that is true. So you would actually agree with Mr. Lott's statement that was earlier and mischaracterized by the chair that a semi-automatic handgun, regardless of the caliber, 9 mil, 40, we don't have to get, I mean, we could do that argument for hours. Regardless of the caliber, a semi-automatic handgun operates 
Every time you depress the trigger, a round comes out, functions exactly identical to a semi-automatic rifle. Well, I don't agree with part of what I don't agree well, with. All I'm asking is, is a semi-automatic rifle, every time you pull the trigger, you, it, a round comes out, correct? The same as a revolver, yes. Thank you. So you agree with the way that Mr. Locke characterized that. I, I've been no, I an elected... Not. I'm sorry? No, I do, I do not agree with I think what he was characterizing... No, a semi-automatic rifle and a semi-automatic handgun function exactly the same. Every time you depress a trigger, a round comes out of the chamber. Is that correct? As well as a revolver and Thank a single-shot gun. So Thank you. So I've been in elected leadership for 12 years. And when I first got elected in 2010 in the State House, uh, Sandy Hook happens shortly after I was in the State House. And being a former military guy who served in a deployed environment and want to find solutions to problems, I started doing research like a good lawyer does. And I saw that in Florida at the time, all of these shootings that were occurring nationwide were happening in gun-free zones, especially in schools, where you have those perpetrators who want to go in and kill as many defenseless children as possible are gonna go to a place where they know that people aren't armed. And at the time, in Florida, we didn't have school resource officers in every single one of our elementary schools. So I filed a bill that would do away with gun-free zones specifically in our schools and develop a policy and a program. I actually worked with Sheriff Demings, uh, Val Demings' husband on this with the Sheriff Association where we would have certified law enforcement officers with concealed carry permits that would go through a spe specific gun safety, <coughs> school safety course, just like the SROs go through, and put those individuals in our school, former current military, former current law enforcement, that would go through a training course that would be able to respond to these type of incidents. Because what Mr. Lott's research has shown, and this is from his, uh, this is today, 94% uh, of mass shootings between 1950 and 2019 occurred in gun-free zones. That is a fact. Sandy Hook's a gun-free zone. Pulse Nightclub was a gun-free zone. Parkland was a gun-free zone. The FSU shooting that we had in Florida was a gun-free zone. And Uvalde was a gun-free zone. And regardless of, we, were never, we will never get evil people out of this world, and regardless of what tool they're using to accomplish the evil they intend on accomplishing, by not having somebody there who is properly trained, who is armed to be able to respond to these type of atrocities, is what is putting all of our children in these horrible situations. And I fought hard to get that changed in Florida, and I believe if that bill would have been passed before Parkland, those kids in Parkland would have been saved because that shooter would know that if he was going to that school, there's gonna be armed trained people on the other side that could respond to that. So I wanna thank, and I'll yield the remainder of time to Mr. Lott to comment specifically on the gun-free zones and through acts of Congress of what we've done to, to make gun-free zones a target for these perpetrators who know that when they walk into a school grounds, there's not gonna be anybody there that's gonna be able to respond in a timely manner. And in Florida, and in my district, average response times, two to four minutes, depending on where law enforcement is. And we all know how quickly the, the travesties of this evil can occur in such a short period of time by not having somebody armed and trained and able to respond. Mr. Lott, I'll yield the remainder of my time to you. Yeah, thank you. Look, I mean, you can just read the diaries and manifestos that these killers leave behind. They make it very clear. They're not stupid. Yes. Their goal is to go and kill as many people as possible. And they know if they go to a place where victims can't defend themselves, they're gonna be able to go and kill more people. We looked at all school shootings of every type, from an accidental discharge all the way up to a mass public school shooting from 2000 on. There are 20 states that have armed teachers. It varies the percentage of schools in different states, but you're talking about literally thousands of schools. And yet in that entire time, there has never been one single attack where anybody's been killed or injured during any school hours where teachers and staff are able to carry. Every single one of these attacks where anybody's been injured or killed have occurred in schools where guns are banned. And you know, would you rather have a sign in front of the school that says this school is a gun-free zone? Would you rather have a sign in front of the school that warns potential attackers that someone, someone that they can't identify beforehand is going to be able to possibly stop them? You know, having one officer in a school in uniform, they have an almost impossible job. It's like putting somebody there with a neon sign that says, shoot me first, if there's going to be an attack. Because they know if they take out the one person in uniform, they're going to have free reign to go after other people that are there. Just read the manifestos, read the diaries. These guys go in ex extreme detail into explaining why they pick the targets that they do. They're not stupid. 
Their goal is to get media attention, and they know the more people they kill, the more attention they're going to get. Thank you for being here. Gentleman yields back. Noted for the record that since the killings in Sandy Hook, 25,000 children have died by gun violence, which evidences that wherever we are, they're making schools a combat zone. Armed persons will do that. Let me yield five minutes to the gentlelady from Pennsylvania, Congressman Dean. Thank you. I thank you, Madam Chair. I thank you to you and to our chairman of the full committee uh, for always focusing on the issue of gun violence and for wanting to make a difference. And finally, this year, making a very small difference. But I thank more the testifiers in front of us. For those who have lost so much, families from Uvalde, Sandy Hook, in neighborhoods uh, around this country, I thank you so much. I always start with the notion of what John Dunn said so many centuries ago. Don't ask for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. It tolls for every single one of us, every time a family member is struck down by violence. <coughs> and while I so value what you have said to us, I'm actually going to ask you to reflect back to me what you're hearing here today. In the face of such loss, in the face of something that is man-made and therefore could be man-solved, you are hearing that the root cause of massacres across this country, like no other industrialized country suffers, is evil. It's mental illness. We need more paddles and prayers. There's too many single moms raising children. Really? Do we have greater evil here? Do we have greater mental illness here? Do we struggle uh, with families and holding families together and proud mothers and fathers who raise children sometimes as single parents? Really? We hear testimony of a headless child. We're going to talk about paddles and prayers might solve this problem. No. Where have we lost our humanity? Early on in this testimony, you heard from the ranking member. His focus, his worry, is that we are trying to emasculate the Second Amendment. My, oh my. To deprive a man of his male role or identity. May not anyone's masculinity be connected to slaughter of children in our country. And so I ask you respectfully, please, please know I respect all of you. When you hear this set of arguments, can you reflect back to me how we bridge the divide, how we really want to work this Congress and next Congress with members across the aisle to find the love and the humanity to find solutions to this man-made problem? So Faith, may I begin with you. When you hear this set of arguments, what do you think? I think it just upsets me because it shouldn't be between two parties. Um, it should be the fact that Americans are dying every day, children in America are dying, and you're arguing over the fact of, well, if we take away this gun, we're taking away our Second Amendment laws. That's not the issue. The issue is, is your people are dying, you were the leaders, and you weren't doing anything about it. Thank you. Dr. Guerrero, what do you think? Um, I think it's disturbing on, on my end because as a pediatrician, you also see the, the parenting side of, of these kids in your clinic every day. And I have plenty of kids that suffer from mental illness that end up being in institutions, that end up as bad kids that had great parents, both mom and dad day in, day out, and the parents are at wit's end saying, I don't know what the hell to do with this kid, and it's not that I did anything wrong or didn't raise him correctly. Um, what is just is, right? And as I mentioned earlier, uh, with the shootings at, at Pulse and at Club Q and, and in El Paso, I wanna focus on that on this, on this uh, side. I'm a proud gay man. 
I'm a proud Mexican-American. I'm also a proud Uvaldian. So all three of these tragedies angle in at me at some root. So don't hear, sit here and tell me it's because this kid wasn't raised right or because uh, they, you know, they were suicidal, went to depression, didn't have a therapist. Yeah. Representatives, he's our Democratic leader in the House. I served with him there. We formed the PA Safe Caucus uh, after uh, Sandy Hook 10 years ago. Uh, we heard these same arguments. What's your reaction when you hear this, this ridiculous clash of arguments? Congresswoman, it's outrageous. I mean, at the end of the day, an 18-year-old accessed a militarized weapon on his 18th birthday, and then again on the next day, and then again the next day. The fact is 18 states have age limits. You passed a bill in the House with an age limit to 21 in the Senate. Compromised bipartisan bill, strip that out. The fact is, if America saw how this young man accessed these weapons, you would be disturbed and disgusted about an 18-year-old going in to buy these types of weapons. 75% of Republicans want age limit increase. Your constituents want an age limit increase to 21. You know, Jesus Christ, he was a fixer. He wasn't a prayer. There's only one time in the Bible he said he to pray, and that was the day before he was arrested. He said, let's pray. The fact is, he fixed things. He did things. He said, let's do something. Let's be kind to immigrants. Let's save kids. Let's protect kids. He was a doer. You're doers. You're fixers. That's what people elected you to do. And now it's time to do something. Not to do something for the moneyed interest. And I we all know about the money in this room. And we know all about the gun Bloomberg. lobby in this room. Bloomberg. And I that's the truth. And I pray that in this upcoming Congress, we will find the power to work together to solve this problem because 97% of gun owners want us to solve this problem. I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. That is the cause and reason of this hearing, and I look forward to that work and yield to Judge Gohmert. Thank you, and I do have great sympathy for the victims, victims, families, represented here. As a former felony judge, I've seen the worst of the worst, and um, anyway, my heart goes out to you. The issue here is what to do about it. Uh, but uh, Mr. Lott, do you have any statistics on what percentage of Americans want to see um, limitations on gun rights? Yes, uh, thank you very much. A lot of the surveys that have been mentioned so far, I think, are pretty misleading. So earlier it was mentioned about support for red flag laws, for example. And if you look at surveys, they'll go and say by two to one, Americans support red flag laws. The problem is the way the questions are asked in all these things makes a huge difference. So for example, uh, for red flag laws, they'll say, do you support judges being able to temporarily take away a person's guns who is a danger to themselves or others? And most people think that's reasonable. The problem is- Well, actually, most places, that's the law. Right, yeah, I understand. I mean, it's already the law even without red flag laws, because right. you have involuntary commitment and other types right. of laws. But uh, the point is, is that um, if you merely tell them two things about red flag laws, that one, that there's no hearing, that occurs before the judge takes away the weapons, and that there are no mental health care uh, professionals involved in the process, unlike involuntary commitment, you end up going from two to one support to almost two to one opposition. Well, Take something like- uh, well, Thank you, I, I just wanted to touch on that, but sure. uh, this is such a critical issue. And um, Reverend Brewer, I appreciate your work. I've seen it over and over in our prisons in Texas, the, the least recidivist rates occur where there has been Christian mentoring and follow-up, and it's been amazing. But unfortunately, a lot of places ban that. Uh, you mentioned about uh, the high percentage of fatherless children that are involved in these kind of violent attacks. Um, but it goes deeper than that, and I know you agree with me. Uh, going back to John Adams, who said, we have no government armed with power capable of contending with 
human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Avarice, ambition, revenge, gallantry would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net. Our Constitution is designed only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for any other. And that's what it comes down to. It, more than just fatherlessness, we have started teaching children that there's no absolute right and wrong. It, it, what feels good is probably okay. We've got schools that are grooming children to be what our current laws say is sexual assault of a child. And it's going on publicly. Our morality as biblical Judeo-Christian morality has gone out the window. So that is the common thread that I've seen. And I agree with the people here. But to this extent, if we're not going to get back to teaching morality, Judeo-Christian principles on which we were founded, as Alexis de Tocqueville said, wow, this is amazing. He said, in Europe, Religion, Christianity, and freedom go two different directions. In the United States, they're inextricably woven together. We got to get back to teaching there is a right or wrong, or I agree with everybody here. We're going to have to get rid of the Second Amendment. We're going to have to get rid of freedom of speech. We're going to have to get rid of freedom of assembly. This Constitution won't work the way we are teaching children. And I'd give you the rest of my time to elaborate on that. Thank you, Mr. Gomer. I mean, I have been working on these issues with my hands for a long time. My question is how many of the folks behind that uh, in Congress have actually been in the prisons actively and going to the inner cities actively? So for me to be called, my idea is to be called idiocy uh, and to be made a mockery of uh, in front of the nation you know, I know that I'm taking that persecution in the name of Jesus because we, I hear a lot of flesh talk. I don't hear any spirit talk. Spirit talk says that we cannot solve things of the flesh with the flesh. The things of the spirit must come in. When you pull a trigger and mass shoot somebody, you are spiritually weak. And for us to sit here as we look and see that 82% of people that commit mass shootings are fatherless. To not look at that as a root cause to me is idiocy. And so when we start talking about our kids, look at what's happening in our public schools. A lot of our public schools, kids are reading three and four grade levels below their proficiency. They don't have dads at home to hold them accountable. And so to say that that doesn't play in to why we have so much gun violence in our streets makes no sense. Go into the prisons and talk to the people who are pulling the trigger. I am here speaking for them because I serve them every day. And the reason, the only way that they rehab is through the word of God. We don't teach God in our schools anymore. We don't even teach the Ten Commandments. Most kids don't even know the Ten Commandments. And so they don't have a fear of God. If you don't have a fear of God, there is no way that you are going to be able to go into a society and, and promote any type of righteousness. We are morally weak as a nation right now, and I think we put that front and center for the American people to see that we have certain people in our government that do not want to stand up for the word of God. That is called the Antichrist, and I yield back, Mr. Gomer. Thank you. My time's expired. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we have votes on the floor of the House. I know that uh, the gentlelady from Pennsylvania was poised but we're at a point now where we think that we would start the gentlelady at the uh, opening back after votes. Okay, whatever you need. Uh, we would appreciate your graciousness. Um, so at this point in time, uh, to the ranking member, uh, the committee now stands in recess. Uh, the witnesses will um, return uh, at the call of the chair, and they will be notified uh, by respective staff. Again, thank the witnesses very much. Uh, the hearing is now only in recess.